This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you all for being here. We'll go ahead and get started. It's my honor to introduce our speaker this morning, Jose Condado. Jose grew up in Venezuela and went to medical school in Caracas. He then did his uh, internal medicine training at Einstein in Philadelphia and received a master's in clinical research from Drexel before coming to Emory, where he worked as a clinical research fellow for Dr. Bablieros and is now in his first year of uh, clinical fellowship. Uh, you can see today he'll be speaking about a failing aortic bioprosthesis. Jose? All right, good morning everyone. I have nothing to disclose. So going to our case, so we have a 78 year old frail female that presented uh, to clinic with, was actually referred to clinic with worsening heart failure symptoms characterized by worsening Disney on reception, orthopnea, PND, lower extremity edema. She was at an NYHA class three at time of presentation. She has a past medical history of a previous aortic valve replacement with a 21 millimeters mosaic valve about 15 years ago, hypertension, diabetes, paroxysmal AFib, hyperlipidemia, and about 30 years ago, she had breast cancer for which she had a mastectomy and local radiation. This is the initial physical exam on presentation in clinic. Normal heart rate, her blood pressure was 122 over 44. Normal pulse ox, BMI of 29.5. She was in good general appearance, no JVDs, but she had a both a two out of six systolic and a two out of six diastolic murmur with a little bit of lower extremity edema. Uh, Lab-wise, it's pretty normal. Normal white count, hemoglobin of 11.8, normal coax. Her creatinine was 0.8 with a slightly elevated BMP and an albumin of 3.6. <clears throat> this is her baseline EKG, which is actually unchanged from her EKG several years before, showing a first degree AB block with an underlying left bundle. Okay, so this is the e initial echo presentation, and you can see here from the parasternal long axis view that you have your uh, bioprosthetic valve with severe AI, the pressure half time was about 150. Uh, she also has some con concomitant aortic valve stenosis with about a mean gradient of 30 and a peak velocity of 3.8. So the formal reading of that echo is read as a normal EF of 55, 60%. The patient has a bioprosthetic aortic valve with severe AI, and uh, as I stated, with a pressure half time of 151 and a deceleration time of 8.4. And uh, she also has some concomitant moderate aortic stenosis with a peak velocity of 3.9 and a mean gradient of 31. Concomitantly, she also has some TR, moderate TR. She has severe mitral annular calcification with mild to moderate mitral stenosis and mild to moderate um, MR. Uh, the patient was also complaining of some palpitations on presentation, so she was sent by her primary cardiologist for an event monitor that mostly show normal sinus rhythm between 70s to 100s, uh, her underlying first degree AB block, a few PVCs, but otherwise no arrhythmias that correlated with her shortness of breath or palpitations. She was also, she underwent for a left heart cath in an outside hospital that only show uh, luminal irregularities without significant coronary disease. <laughs> Medication wise, she's on aspirin, atenolol, Lasix, ACTC, Losartan, and for her diabetes, she's on metformin, some potassium, simvastatin for her uh, hyperlipidemia. So we have a patient that has a, a previous aortic bioprosthesis uh, that is now presented with symptomatic severe AI and moderate AS. So what options can we offer to this patient? So can we do medical therapy alone? Can we do, sur can we do valve replacement with their surgery or transcatheter techniques? So for medical therapy, this is from the 2014 AHA guidelines. Uh, as a, they have as a, oops, sorry. They have as a class one recommendation uh, that patients with severe AI should be treated uh, for, if the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is over 140, can be treated with either a calcium channel blockers, an ACE inhibitors, or an ARB. 
and our patient is already on Losartan and remains symptomatic, which means that despite medical therapy, she is unlikely to feel better despite of what we do. She already had a, an, a, an appropriate blood pressure and she was already treated with medical therapy as recommended by guidelines. So the, the second question is, can we replace the valve? And if we're gonna replace it, are we gonna do either surgical or a transcatheter replacement? So surgical aortic valve replacements is, uh, this is again from the AHA guidelines as a class 2A recommendations. The surgery is reasonable for operable patients with severe symptomatic or asymptomatic bioprosthetic regurgitation. And again, I think the key word in this uh, sentence is operable patients. So obviously you really want to take somebody to the OR if they are actually likely to survive the procedure and, and benefit from the procedure. So uh, SABR is the most common valve performed in the U.S. And um, the issue of failing uh, aortic bioprosthesis is going to become increasingly frequent in the U.S. And uh, for several reasons. One is that because we're now doing more severe or valve replacement with a bioprosthesis. And this is a graph from a paper published from the STS National Registry in the U.S. Uh, that look at the trend of valve placements between 1996 and 2006. And you can see that over this decade period, there was a large increase of the number of bioprosthetics being implanted and a dec with a concomitant decrease of mechanical valves, despite no significant difference in baseline characteristics of the patients. So uh, surgeons are getting more comfortable and more used to putting bioprosthetic valves. And we also have a growing aging population in the U.S., and because these, li these, these valves are expected to, they have an average life expectancy between 10 and 20 years, uh, it's inevitable that we will be seeing these kind of situations in the near future. So what about uh, the safety and the outcomes of reduced surgical aortic valve replacement? So a lot of the data that we have on these kind of scenarios comes from a case series that have been published. This is actually one that was published by a group in Canada. And you can see that there's a very wide uh, range of indications with about um, as almost half or 40% of patients undergoing a reduced surgical valve replacement for endocarditis. What about one quarter where underwent either valve replacement for uh, bioprosthesis, bioprosthesis valve dysfunction or degeneration, or because of PVL uh, as well. So by far the most common reasons are endocarditis and then followed by valve dysfunctions and PVL. As you can see, the postoperative outcomes and the average age of these patients was about 60 years old of this group of patients, uh, you can see that uh, it's, it's not a benign procedure. About 40% of patients had a postoperative arrhythmia. 22% of people eventually require a pacemaker after the valve replacement. The rate of stroke was 6%, 7% recourse failure, and the early mortality at 30 days was about 4.5%. So it's not benign, but uh, as you can see here, once they divided patients into the type of indications between those that had endocarditis and those without endocarditis, you can see that those that underwent reduced SABR for, uh, for indications other than endocarditis, such as valve dysfunctions, as you would expect, they have better outcomes with a pretty good eight-year survival of almost 80%. Now, the issue of redo valve in the elderly is a little bit different. So this prior group I just showed you, her, their average age was about 60 years old. But we know that these people, especially the patients with the three leaflets by uh, aortic stenosis that undergone valve they are usually older. And uh, what we need to know and what we'll likely be seeing more often is this group of patients that have reduced SABR because of be, uh, and old. Um, so in, uh, this is another case series of patients older than 70 years old with a mean age of about 75 years that underwent redo valve surgery. And as you can see here, uh, two years their survival was actually not bad with about uh, 84% and at five years 67%. So reasonable survival, but as you would expect, old, older people don't live as long as younger people. So it's less than what I previously showed you in, in the overall population of surgical valve replacements. Uh, this is a, another story as well that actually classify valve surgeries depending on either a mitral or reduced mitral or reduced SABR. And as you can see here, 70, about 73% had no complications after the procedure. But I mean, at the same time, the hospital death was about 13%. Uh, 
Uh, the ro stroke rate again was about 4%, risk of renal failure 7%, respiratory failure 14%, patients stay in the hospital for two weeks. So it's a pretty l l more, it has significant morbid mortality, especially at the beginning, but in those patients that actually survive, especially those that underwent aortic valve, redo aortic valve replacement, which is shown in the dark dots here, had a, a, a good uh, survival of about 70% uh, at five years. So the, this is where we need to like, so overall we know from this information that um, in properly selected patients, reduced SABR can be a feasible option, especially even in elderly people, as long as we're able to properly stratify and select who is gonna benefit from this procedure. And this is where the risk scores come into play. So overall, there are two risk scores that we usually use to uh, stratify patients. There's the STS score, which is the one we use here in the US. It was created from the STS National Registry that collects all the surgical data from, from the US. And basically, they have a score for either isolated valve surgery, combined surgeries, even if you're going for cabbage. So basically, you go on, the, on their website, you put in the type of surgery that is going to be performed, and then you, pu you put in all these uh, variables, the patient's age, uh, comorbidities, whether they have diabetes, a FIP, uh, ejection fraction, creatinine, uh, BMI, and some of, one of the parameters that is included in this uh, score is the number of prior operations that the patient has. The other score that is used and is mostly used in Europe is the Euroscore. And again, it's about the same kind of type of characteristics. They just classify them as slightly different and they give weight uh, slightly different to certain parameters. Uh, to be honest, it's a little bit simpler than the STS score. So if we go back to our patients, uh, her calculated STS score was about 7.2%. And what this means is that she has a 30-day uh, mortality or expected predicted mortality of 7.2%. The nice thing about the STS score is that it also gives you a little bit of extra information regarding the morbid, mortal morbid mortality of the procedure. So you can see that this specific patient has about a 30% risk of having some type of morbid mortality if she goes for open heart surgery. Uh, with an expected with expected 30% risk of prolonged long length of stay, she has a 2.6 risk of stroke, 25% risk of having a prolonged ventilation, and an 8% risk of having a renal failure. Um, but going to her Euroscore again is simpler, but her Euroscore is about 8.2%. So basically, we have a now an. Uh, 78-year-old lady that has severe AI, moderate AS, symptomatic, that needs her valve fix, but has an STS score of 7.2. So what kind of surgical risk does she has? So this is how the 2014 AHA guidelines recommend to classify patients uh, according to the surgical risk. And the way that we are kind of used to is to classify patients according to the STS score. And being low risk, those than less than 4%, Intermediate risk if you have a score of about 4 to 8 percent, high risk if you have a score more than 8 percent. So just by STS score, she would fall into the intermediate risk almost on the high risk group. And now the prohibited risk is those that have about a more than 50 percent risk of dying within one year. So, but you need also need to understand that there's other factors that they recommend that you need to take into consideration. So one factor is frailty. And uh, the way to define frailty is either by performing a five minute walk test and see if they can do it in less than six seconds, which is the ideal scenario. And then you also ask about the daily activities that the patient performs. If the patient performs, uh, is unable to perform at least two daily activities, then she's considered more to severe frailty, which was the case in this patient. She was seen by CT surgery and then they consider her to be moderate to severe frail, which jumps her into a high risk category. Other factors that also take, need to be considered is the risk of major organ compromise, if uh, not to be improved by the procedure, and the procedure specific risk factors that are not included in the risk course. And for these specific patients, another procedure specific risk factor that is not in the STS score is that she did have a chest radiation about 30 years ago. So the fact that she has prior chest radiation, previous surgery, which made it a, a, host, uh, a, a hostile chest, combined with the fact that she has moderate to severe frailty and an STO, STS score of 7.2, she was considered to be a high surgical risk patient. 
So the follow-up question is, so we have uh, now high surgical risk patients that have symptomatic severe AI and moderate AS. Uh, can we do uh, a TAVR, basically? And in this case, it will be a valve within a valve, a valve in valve TAVR. So and this is just a picture of so some of the many TAVR valves that are being developed are in different stages of clinical research. Um, being the, the, there are two valves that are currently commercially approved. Uh, one is the core valve that you can see here. This is the self-expandable core valve. And then the second one is the balloon expandable sapien valve that you can see down here. And this is an old generation. There are follow two more generations after this valve. The other valves are about, about in clinical trials, the portico valve, the lotus, the direct flow, and they are usually not used in these kind of scenarios. So a lot of the information that we have on TAVR comes from all the clinical trials of patients with native aortic valve stenosis. So uh, the, the partner trial has studied the balloon expandable sapien valve, and the core valve trials, as the name suggests, has studied the core valve, the, core valve, the self-expandable core valve. So in 2010, the partner 1B was published that showed that the balloon expandable TAVR was uh, superior to medical therapy in patients that were considered inoperable. And so that led to the FDA approval in that group uh, of that valve. Um, similarly, in 2014, the U.S. Extreme Risk Pivotal Trial was published, and this is not a randomized trial. This was just a prospectively enrolled cohort of patients that were considered inoperable that underwent TAVR with the Corval, and they had a similar outcomes to those observed in the Partner 1B, and because of that, they also gained FDA approval for that group of patients. In 2011, the Partner 1A showed that uh, in higher surgical risk patients, balloon, ta balloon expandable tower was, uh, had similar outcomes to SABR. And in 2014, the core valve, similarly in high risk patients, had actually better survival with TAVR than with SABR. Lately, um, in last year, we just they just published the intermediate risk a group of the balloon expandable uh, partner 2A that showed that TAVR and SABR had similar outcomes in intermediate risk patients with a subgroup analysis uh, that was actually published by Dr. Turani. Um, showing that in propensity match patients that went TF tower versus SABR with the Sapien 3 tower, we had a better, out, better survival than SABR. So the problem here is that valin val tower is, is not exactly the same as tower. Um, and in that regard, there are a couple of things that, that are good and a couple of things that are bad. So the good is that the the, bio, the original bioprosthesis can serve as a fluoroscopic landmark during the valve deployment and you, that, that you can use. And the other good thing is that because you have a frame that is circular, first of all, instead of the oval shape of the, of the native annulus, you're less likely to have paravalvular leak with valin valve tower, and you're less likely to have conduction abnormalities because of overexpansion and collapsing of the conduction system. However, because uh, the prior surgery can distort the anatomy um, because of deployment issues, uh, this valin valve tower it is more prone to have uh, coronary obstructions, malposition, and the bigger problem that uh, you have to take into consideration is this Russian doll model. And basically, you start with this frame, and these are the original leaflets, and then you're putting a second valve inside that frame. So inevitably, you're gonna have a s smaller effective orifice area just because you're putting, you're progressively putting more. So if you, if you end up having to put a second tower valve, then you have even more uh, decrease in that effective or orifice area, which can increase the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. So a lot of the outcomes and of valin valve tower that we have come from the valin valve registry that is run by the uh, group in Vancouver, Canada. Um, this registry was created in 2010. Uh, it includes uh, valley valve uh, data from about 38 centers across Europe, North America, um, the Middle East, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, so this is the first experience that was published in 2012. Um, and as you can see here, um, all, about 202 patients that underwent a valley valve tower with either the sapien or the core valve. And in this group, uh, based on characteristics, as, as you would expect in most of these people, with an average STS score of about 12%, so high risk or very high risk people. Uh, and all of them, almost all of them, having an NYHA class two, uh, two or, three, or three or four. 
Um, oh gosh, sorry. Okay. So um, this is a, a, a little bit more on the, the baseline characteristics. So you can see that the average time frame for the median time from surgery to valve replacement was nine years only on this group of patients. Um, with a mixture of both stented and stentless, but mostly most patients are stented by prosthesis. Um, this, this will come into play as I'll talk a little bit more in, in a bit. Uh, but you can see that they classify patients into whether they had a small, a medium size, or a large bioprosthesis, and about a quarter of patients had an original small bioprosthesis like our patients. <laughs> the other important difference between this uh, that this experience shows is that unlike the clinical trials on TAVR that has evaluated patients specifically for aortic stenosis, the but patients that are undergoing valinval TAVR is like a little bit of a mixed bag of patients. You have uh, patients with AS, patients with regurgitation, and patients with combined disease. Um, that will also play a role in outcomes. So overall, this initial experience was pretty good. They have a procedural success of 93%. And in TAVR, usually you call procedure success if you have, obviously, the patient survives the procedure. You only have to deploy one valve. If you um, have a less than mild or less paravalvular leak and a mean gradient post-deployment of less than 20. So those are the VAR2 criteria that we usually use to classify device success. Um, but you can see here that about um, a, a significant number of patients require either device retrieval or placement of a second valve because of malposition, and about 3.5% risk of coronary obstruction. Um, after patients were sent home, they still have a 30-day survival of about a, a 30-day death of a mortality of about 8.4%. Risk of stroke was not terribly high, but um, most of the patients actually at, at least of 30 days had a symptomatic improvement in their NYHA class. So as you remember at the beginning, they were almost all in three to four. Now they were almost all of them are in one or two NYHA class. So at least symptomatically, we're doing good to them. And it sounds like uh, despite some initial risk, especially of coronary obstruction and malposition. Um, I understand that this is a little bit of a busy graph, but um, basically this graph shows uh, those patients that underwent TAVR with the sapien and those that underwent TAVR with the core valve. And you have here the post-procedural gradients, 20 being the number that we consider procedural success. And then they classify patients according to a small bioprosthesis, medium-sized bioprosthesis, large bioprosthesis. And you can see that even though uh, like a large number of patients were considered successful, there were some uh, patients that on the, uh, still continue to have high gradients post-deployment, especially those patients in the area here. You can see this guy had like a super high gradients post-deployment, which I'm not really sure if I believe that. But anyhow, that's what they published. At one year, um, they have an average survival of more than 80%. So from this initial experience of Valinval Tower, uh, they concluded that Valinval Tower is clini clinically affected in most patients, but uh, they were able to raise some important safety concerns, as I just explained, of device, mal device malposition, osteal obstruction, so having high gradients. Then they published a follow-up study with about 459 patients uh, in 2014. And I'm not going to show you the basic characteristics because, honestly, they're very similar to what the previous ones were. But they did look, because they had a larger sample size, they were able to uh, dig, dig deeper into predictors or independent predictors of poor outcomes. And one of the things that they were able to identify is that the type of disease that you start with is related to your one-year survival. So if you have predominantly, predominantly aortic stenosis, then you're likely to do worse if you have mostly AR. Or patient is probably in this group of combined disease. The other important finding that they also saw as an independent predictor was the size of the bioprosthesis uh, that the patient had underwent valinval tower. And as, it, as in all patients, patients with a small bioprosthesis had a significantly worse one-year survival than those with larger bioprosthesis. And a lot of this has to do with having higher gradients and a lot of, um, um, more patient prosthesis mismatch. So from this follow-up experience, 
uh, we were, they were able to conclude that uh, Valleyval Tower continues to be a feasible alternative in high-risk patients with about a one-year survival of 83%, but uh, again, new safety concerns of uh, in patients with uh, predominantly valve stenosis and in those with a small bioprosthesis like our patients. So we now know that uh, Valleyval Tower has a high risk of uh, osteocoronary obstruction and malposition and uh, we need to really think hard if we're going to do Valinval Tower, especially if the patient is having a small bioprosthesis. So, since then, uh, there have been a couple of options that have come and have been uh, published uh, to deal with this problem. And one is to crack the original bioprosthesis with a balloon. <laughs> uh, sounds a little bit wild, but it has been published. Uh, this is actually from a case series published by the Germans. Uh, in this specific case, was uh, for patients in the with pulmonic bioprosthesis, and what they initially tested outside is this is an Atlas balloon, which is a high pressure balloon, and they they pl they expanded it enough so they could get the original bioprosthesis to crack, and they actually did that on the patients obtaining improvement of the of the gradients. And historically, there uh, or at least word of mouth is that several places, uh, in both in the U.S. and in the world, are starting to kind of trying to use this approach of at least aggressively dilating this small bioprosthesis. <laughs> the second um, issue that to con take into consideration is uh, the deployment location of the bioprosthesis. And this is actually a paper that we published with uh, in collaboration with the Georgia Tech guys. Um, in which um, we study the, the different deployment locations in an in vitro model. So we put a, uh, this is a perimount valve, a small perimount valve. Uh, we deploy in this in vitro model that beats, uh, has a positive beating. And then uh, they de the engineers deploy the valves in different locations, the normal recommended locations, and then further supranural deployments until you get to this point in which actually the valve looks like a flower pot. And the idea is that if you have fuller expansion distally, uh, then you have a fuller improvement of the effective orifice area. And as a matter of fact, that's what we saw. So if you see here gradients and the deployment height, uh, this is the original by uh, Perryman uh, working. And on the normal deployment location, you have a high risk of having elevated gradients. But as you go fuller supraannular, you have improvement of the grains all the way until the plus eight millimeters deployment in which you almost get to the same level that you have with the original bioprosthesis. Now the second, and, and this correlated with the improvements of effective orifice area as well. So the second question is, okay, so you're gonna have better gradients, but is it safe? Uh, how likely is if you're gonna deploy the valve up here uh, for the valve to embolize and fly away? So to test that, there were two things that uh, were done. We did one is the pull-out forces that I'm not showing here, and the second one is the embolization flow rate. Um, what this is is that you increase the flow of the system until the valve embolizes outside of the original bioprosthesis. And um, as you can see here, the 30-day liters per minute threshold is what the industry standard is for safety. And uh, you can see that the supranural deployments between three and six millimeters, you have uh, remained within a safety threshold. But in the extreme supranural deployment, as you would expect, you're more likely to have embolization. So basically, from this study, we concluded or we could that potentially a deployment between three and six millimeters supranular would be ideal, especially if you're going to do valin valve tower in a, with a sapien valve. And I know that. Uh, uh, here, we, the, the structural team has done several cases with these supranural deployments. So the second issue to make things a little bit harder as well is that not all bioprosthesis are the same. And uh, so when, when, and this is just an example, uh, you have a standard, a standless, sutureless bioprosthesis, and all these bioprosthesis are called 23 millimeters in size. But actually, when you look at the internal diameter, which is what you really care, which is the area that you're actually going to deploy the valve in, uh, the internal diameters vary greatly between, for example, a Hankel 2 has an 18.5 internal diameter, whether an uh, intuitive valve or a perimount valve has a 21 millimeter diameter. So this internal diameter will affect the type of tower valve that you could potentially put in. And that's why you need to first know which valve you're going to be putting in and then also do a CT on the patients to actually measure the actual internal diameter that they have. 
And one good thing is that there are a couple of things that can be used to guide and simplify this process. One is that there's an IFU that has been published re recommending this, the valve for each specific valve. And then there's a <coughs> app that you can download on your phone or your, or, or, or your iPhone. And basically what you do is that you choose the bioprosthesis that you have, the size of the bioprosthesis, the app gives you the appearance of the bioprosthesis and the fluoroscopic appearance of it. And then it tells you a recommendation of what options do you have. Can you put a Corval 23 or a Sapien 23 and so forth. So it gives you recommendations on depending on the type of valve that you want to put in and the type of valve that, you, that the patient has. So if we go back to our patients, um, so again, she's high cervical risk and she has a 21 millimeters mosaic valve. And the issue with this specific valve is that the effective internal diameter of the valve is 16.5 millimeters, so it's really small. And actually, if you go to the IFU and the app, there's really no, no transcatheter valve indicated for this specific type of valve. So can, can it still be done, or should we just tell her that she just should go for open heart surgery? Um, by the bullet. Uh, so in order to answer that question, we actually uh, talk back to our friends at Georgia Tech, and this is actually the, the a mosaic valve implanted, and then they did a, a normal deployment of the sapien valve, a supranular deployment of the sapien valve, a normal deployment of the core valve, and supranular deployment of the core valve. And then with the, with the core valve, with the sapien valve, you can see that flower pot appearance that I was showing to you, how the struts also give in, and so you can have like that expansion of the valve. And, and you can see here that as you would expect and as we saw in the previous paper, is that um, with the supranular deployment of the sapien valve, you do get, get improvements of the gradients from 17 to 10, uh, with a slightly increased risk of having a regurgitation of about 2.9%. And with the Corval, um, you actually have similar uh, gradients be between the normal and the supranormal deployment. And the main reason for this is that unlike the sapien valve, the Corval is designed to have a supranormal leaflets to begin with. So even if you're doing a normal deployment of the valve, you you're still having a supranormal uh, leaflets that can expand. And uh, with the, however, with the supranormal deployment of the corval, you did have a slightly increased risk of gradients. So because our patient had uh, a coronary height, measured coronary height of six millimeters, which is considered sh very low. I mean, usually 10 is kind of the threshold that you say to be safe. And we, it was felt that the corval in the normal position was a better option for this patient. And that's what was done. So the patient went for a, tra a transfemular minimalist approach. Um, for do those that don't know, the minimalist approach it was uh, is like a poster boy of Emory. Uh, we uh, so so is this tower that is done under conscious sedation instead of uh, general anesthesia using transthoracic echo instead of TE. And a, a study that was published about in 2014 by your group here. Uh, showed that a uh, minimalist tower had similar outcomes, but it led to shorter length of stay and less money. So less money is always good. Um, so this is the deployment of the valve, and because of the coronary high, she also had a non-selective uh, coronary angiography during after deployment that shows both the left main and the RCA to be pattern. And then because she did have a slightly increased po uh, gradients after deployment, she underwent post dilatation with a 80 millimeter true balloon, and it was felt that the valve cracked. So that led to improvement of the gradients. So we did both the cracking and the deployments. And so the final gradients were after deployment was a mean gradients of 11 millimeters of mercury, which is very interesting as we predicted in the in vitro model to be 13. Um, the patient had no complications, one set, was sent to the telemetry floor, ambulatory without issues, as she was sent home one day after the procedure. Um, on follow-up, she says that she's feeling better. Her Disney out exertion has drastically improved. She no longer has PND or orthopnea. Um, she did continue to complain of palpitations, and because of that, uh, her underlying conduction disease, she was sent to CEP, and EP felt that a biventricular pacemaker was necessary, and she had that done uh, with improvement of her symptoms. Um, 
This is her follow-up echo. So you can see it in, again from the parasternal long axis, the bioprosthesis with no AI, and the egg gradients actually improved to six millimeters at four months. She continues to have severe mitral annular calcifications and moderate AS, for which she will need to be uh, followed closely, but she's clinically improved and has a well-functioning uh, bath even at four months already. The last thing is about durability. So uh, we, we, we did this good. I felt with the patient was done well. Uh, she had this procedure done, symptomatically improved. The question is, how long is this going to last? Uh, will, will the valve fail because uh, you have two valves within another valve? And only time will tell the durability of valve valve tower. But this is actually from another study that we published from, with the Georgia Tech guys, in which we tested different valve heights of both the CPN and the core valve. And the engineers very astutely were able to come up with this idea of the pinwheeling index. So pinwheeling has been associated with worse durability on surgical bioprosthesis. And what that means is that if you see this very straight uh, co-optation of the leaflets, if you have this pinwheeling appearing here, it's likely to create more uh, disturbing of disturbance of flow. And potentially, you're more prone to either have thrombosis and worsening uh, less durability of the valve. And then they calculated the pinwheeling. So basically, they took using with a the camera, they, they measured the, the ideal length with the actual length. And then using this formula, an index was calculated. And as you can see here, um, there's a variability. So the deployment height uh, can, be, um, can, can be associated uh, with either worsening uh, pinwheeling and also the size of the valve being deployed. So if you deploy a 26 core valve within a 23 perimeter, you're more prone to have pinwheeling that if you deploy a smaller valve. So if you can expand the valve more, then you're likely to have pinwheeling with the worst case being seen if you go with a subannular deployment of the core valve. You can see here how bad the pinwheeling is. And I mean, this is not a, a deployment location that you probably will ever do, but if you misplace the valve and ended up putting it there, then you, you're, you have that concern on top of everything that you're gonna have potentially worse durability of the valve. So basically from this information, uh, the deployment height is not only important uh, for better outcomes and better gradients, but it can also uh, potentially gonna have uh, implications on the valve durability. So in conclusion, so patients with failing, we're, we're doomed to see more patients with failing bioprosthesis in the near future because of an aging population and increases use of bioprosthesis and the durability of these valves. And SABR is uh, a reasonable strategy in, in a lot of patients, but we need to be specific to each patient, to stratify the risk using the hard team approach, using risk scores and assessment of frailty. And now, most patients, especially if they're considered high surgical risk, can be treated with either reduced cyber or valin valve tower. Um, we now know from both the growing experience that valley valve tower is a feasible option with good one year survival, but you need to understand the risk, especially of high gradients, coronary obstructions, malpositions, especially if you have a patient with a small bioprosthesis. And to deal with this, there's some going research that we're working on to try to solve this issue and get better, better results after the procedure. And durability will be the ultimate test that these valves will have to respond. So thank you to all the structural team that has always been very supportive of me. And I don't have any questions. Thanks, Jose. That was a great talk. Um, two quick questions. You mentioned at the end the concern about longer-term durability. I understand very limited experience. What signals are available so far, maybe on a case report level, as to the durability both of the, the TAVRs in general and then in the valve and valve context? And then the second uh, simple question, just because I'm ignorant, what are the prospects for surgical valve replacement after valve and valve? So say you have a young patient that was unlucky or congenital disease, has a bioprosthetic with a valve and valve, and then for a third valve, um, is surgery an option, technically? Yeah, so to the first question about durability, so the longest reported data from the partner trial is five years. Um, there are some studies about eight years, I think is the longest that I can find. 
Um, for Valley Val Tower, it's about there are a few case reports that you can probably find in that area. Um, I mean, for from experience, I know of patients that probably haven't been published that have been around that long. So I mean, there are patients around that have had these valves for a good while and they're still working. Um, for the second question was um, surgical valve replacement oh yeah. after valve. So yeah, so that that's. Uh, doable. I think that's what a lot of the, the structural, like congenital patients, that the structural team works here for. So try to instead of having like three surgeries uh, before you're 30 years old, you can have like one surgery, get a valve involved. You're buying yourself at least maybe eight years, ten years, and then you'll have to go for a redo surgery. But yeah, you eventually, like in that, that's probably the best scenario because you're eventually gonna have to go for a redo surgery. Otherwise, you keep decreasing that that like. A Russian doll, right? And then you have would a few that, problems. Would that next surgery require a, a root replacement as well? Or does it depend on the valve? That actually I don't know. What do, what do you think? I think that depends <clears throat> on the valve used. If you have core valve and it's touching uh, the superannular area, you, you will probably have to do ascending as well. But, um, but the core valves are now much narrower than they've ever been. And so a lot of times their fixation is only at the level of the of the surgical valve, so you, you, it, it's very possible that you won't need that. Um, Jose, just a few comments here. First of all, congratulations, it was a great talk. Um, for those of you uh, that don't know, Jose spent two years with us doing research and a lot of collaboration, which we joked about, but it was true with uh, our in vitro team at Georgia Tech. And a lot of these questions we had started thinking about superangular deployments very early on because our first implants, we had put the valve, we had put the, the TAVI valve right in the center of the bioprosthetic valve and would end up with really high gradients and quickly changed to a higher and higher deployment and were able to publish this. Um, um, it was one of the, the first groups to publish it, which we had the in vitro data that was very successful. The longest... Um, Patient that's been around is nine years. It was one of the early sapien valves that Cribier implanted. She's an old French lady in, in Paris and died in, in her 90s. There, there is some data coming out. Five years looks great, but maybe some uh, signs of early valve deterioration at, at seven or eight years. We do not have all that data in the surgical, with the surgical valves, at least on the newer surgical valves, and, and that, of course, will be part of the low-risk partner trial as we have people that have longer follow-ups now. <clears throat> our average age has been in the 80s for so long. Our follow-ups were rarely longer than four years, uh, and now implanting people in their 70s, we will have 10-year data to compare both surgical and, and TAVR valves. The one thing that, that hasn't been mentioned that, that needs to be talked about is the elephant in the room is valve thrombosis. And we are still trying to understand that very similar to what happened in the coronary stent world. We are seeing early valve failure secondary to valve thrombosis. We think the problem may be more common with the TAVR valves than with the SAVR valves. But one thing for sure, the valve and valve option probably doesn't inc increase thrombosis <clears throat> unless you're using superannular valves like, like Jose suggested with core valve. All our patients that are getting valve and valve now are being started on Coumadin for duration unknown. A little bit like we did with the coronary stents when we put people on Plavix for three months, then six months, and then we'd go for a year. And then we said, well, if it's not bothering you, just stay on it. And certainly as the technology improved, now we are, we are more confident with stopping Plavix, but there was a time in which we kept it going for long periods of time until we figured all of that out. So you would say, how much research can go into putting a, a little stented valve in a tube, and it, it's a ton, uh, and, and more to come, but we think that the age at which patients will get a bioprosthetic valve in the United States will continue to drop because of this technology. Mm -hmm. And it has dropped in Europe, and if uh, that's any marker what's to come, and it usually is in the United States, patients now in their early 60s are getting bioprosthetic valves in Europe as opposed to mechanical valves. And that may be uh, an age that continues to drop, particularly with surgical valves that are being designed now for valve and valve. Because we are cracking them. It's a little bit brutal. Sometimes it even sounds like a gunshot when you crack it in the lab. But um, there are going to be surgical valves that are going to have a mechanism that you can 
expand them later when you come for valve and valve and those are being tested and all the major valve companies are designing them. So more to come, uh, but um, certainly if you have patients that, that you even wonder about this, um, you know, we're, we're always around, it seems like, so uh, we're happy to sort of give our opinion or and our opinion is usually a balanced opinion, both surgical and interventional cardiologists and, and, and our imaging colleagues. So we're, we're happy to, to support. So what's the downside of that crack? I don't know um, because there's no standard uh, technique for cracking. The crack that we've done has been modest. So the inner diameter of this valve was 16 and a half, and I used an 18 Kevlar balloon. It's uh, it's um, it's made by a company that that's really um, almost puncture resistant, and uh, I was able to expand the 16 and a half to 18 because I felt like I just needed a little bit more room in there. And what Jose didn't show with the gradient continued to fall even with this this maneuver by a few. Um, I imagine if you made an aggressive crack, you could have an annular rupture. Uh, or, uh, you know, periodic hematoma or something like this. I have not seen anything in the literature yet. I'm not sure people will want to publish in the literature, <laughs> but usually the people that publish those things in the literature are, are echocardiographers, uh, <laughs> not the interventional cardiologists. We call them the paparazzi. Like, Look what happened. It's amazing. Um, but, um, you know, I, I do worry a little bit about being over-aggressive with the crack. The good news is, and I don't know if you picked this up from Jose's slides, but the mosaic valve that he showed, the 21 mosaic valve virgin, had a mean gradient of 14 and a half. After the, the, the core valve, even in the in vitro testing, the mean gradients were 12. So the drag occurs primarily at the level of the leaflets. If you could put those leaflets super annular above the, the, the most narrow part, you can get lower gradients than even the valve when it was originally placed surgically. So I'm, I'm not sure you have to get overly aggressive with the cracks or the, the pediatric population or the adult congenital population would be the one that, that I think we're, we're still going to have to, to consider whether you replace the whole valve or, or, or crack it. And I'm sure that makes our, our pediatric surgical colleagues very happy, but, <laughs> but, but I think that's appropriate. Is it a purposeful crack, or you just, the balloon just blows up when you're trying to blow up your... your no, the, the balloon, there, there are only certain valves that will yield. For example, if you try and dilate a, a mitral ring that has a titanium ring in it, you will bust the balloon before you crack the ring. So, you know, there are some mitral rings that have very uh, bizarre shapes, uh, they're like a very extreme oval. You can't really implant a valve in those, and we've tried to expand them on the bench top. Fortunately, not not in a patient, and realize that you can't overcome that power. But a lot of these valves, particularly at their base, are, are plastic, and so they they can break. So you do have a, a coronary that gets occluded, and you do have a, a bad outcome. Do they go immediately to the OR, or what, what happens? Uh, I, I think that you have to, uh, uh, so there's two options. One, if you use the shorter tabber valves like the Sapiens, you can wire the coronary if you anticipate obstruction. You have to anticipate it, though. You, you wire it. We usually have a stent waiting there. We deploy the valve, and then we deploy the stent from the left main into the order like a snorkel. So that's one technique that we've done that works. The other one is that the core valve now is retrievable. So you can roll it out, do an angiogram before you release it. If it looks like it's going to obstruct, roll it back up and tell the patient it's not possible. Doug, you had a question? Yeah, the question, you were talking about the valve in the valve, and you said you anticoagulated. Have you used any of the, the DOAX, uh, or do you isolate only the Coumadin? Yeah, I uh, isolate only the Coumadin. Um, there is some anecdotal evidence. I mean, most of this, the evidence out there, um, Doug, is uh, retrospective gathered stuff. So it's hard to know what it means, but it does not look like the NOAX give the same level of protection as Coumadin for these valves. And then I saw earlier that it was kind of controversy of what was the appropriate anti-platelet or anti-coagulation therapy because just the, the 
tavern. Yeah. What have you settled on? What should we use? Yeah, so that, that's a great question because I would say <clears throat> if you look at the, the scale of what's going to thrombose, what's more likely to thrombose, valve and valve in the mitral position with a heart failure, low EF patient, I think that's the highest. And then um, probably best uh, scenario is high implant, aortic, native, um, maybe with a core valve might even be the lowest risk of thrombosis. That's the best. So, so what do you do with all these patients that are in between and so forth? Because I will say the mitral valve and valve low EF patients, they all go on Coumadin, that's for sure. And these patients will go on Coumadin for, for some time for valve and valve for native. We don't know. Um, the valve thrombosis is estimated between 5 and 15 percent, depending on what you look at with CT. We see some leaflets that can be a little bit lazy. Some of them are lazy and thickened, and some of them are lazy, lazy thickened with some heaps of thrombus on them, and those ones are clear to us they are probably thrombus. We are putting most patients on aspirin and Plavix still uh, for six months, and um, <clears throat> there is a trial that is looking at NOACs for that, those specific patients, not, not the high-risk ones, but more of a, a straightforward um, uh, TAVR, which we will have. It's a slow enrolling trial, but we might have the answer in a few years. And, and there are some individual sites that are testing Coumadin for three months uh, versus aspirin and Plavix, obviously bridging people just to aspirin and Plavix. We have settled primarily on, on aspirin and Plavix unless the patient has some sort of high-risk feature. You made a low implant, um, cardiomyopathy, the patient has other reasons to be on anticoagulation, and we try, if we do it, we try and push for Coumadin. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.